Welcome everybody to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two that are held online, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are at all interested in learning more about us, feel free to grab a staff member after the event. Additionally, to support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu backslash donate. Today we will be hearing from Dr. Henry Nowy, who will deliver a lecture entitled Thinking About Ukraine for Options. Dr. Henry R. Nowy is a professor emeritus of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. He holds a BS degree in economic, economics, politics, and science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and an MA and PhD degrees from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, or the SICE program. Some of his published works include Conservative Internationalism, Armed Diplomacy Under Jefferson, Polk, Truman, and Reagan, The Myth of America's Decline at Home and Abroad, and Perspectives on International Relations. He has also taught at Williams College from 1971 to 73, and George Washington University from 73 to 2019. From January 1981 to September 1983, he served on President Reagan's National Security Council as a senior staff member for International Economic Affairs and White House Sherpa for the annual G7 Economic Summits at Ottawa in 1981, Versailles in 1982, Williamsburg in 1983, and a special summit with developing countries at Cancun, Mexico in 1982. Dr. Nowy also served in 1975 to 77 as special assistant to the Undersecretary of Economic Affairs in the Department of State, and from 1963 to 65 as lieutenant in the 82nd Airborne Division in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. With that, please welcome Dr. Henry Nowy. Thank you. So good evening. Uh, don't forget about your microphone. Oh, yes. Yeah. We'll turn this into more of a conversation than a lecture. But thanks for showing up. If you hadn't shown up, my lecture would have been canceled. Um, anyway, it's good to be here. I'm sort of reminded of it's the opposite of what we're looking at here, but it's kind of a funny story anyway. When I worked in the State Department in the mid-1970s, from 75 to 77, I worked in the office of the Deputy Secretary of State. So I got a good chance to see Henry Kissinger, uh, in various um, in sundry meetings, usually late at night uh, after he wandered back from the um, from the White House, because he was doing, as you recall, uh, both uh, the State Department uh, Secretary and the White House uh, National Security Advisor. And um, the, on the day he left, which was in January of 1977, and he left peacefully, um, he came down in the middle of the big forum that they have there, they had at the time uh, in the State Department, backing on to the uh, open air kind of atrium that they have, and the place was packed. It was absolutely packed. And um, he, he had, uh, Kissinger had a love-hate relationship with the bureaucracy, but in any case, the place was packed. And so Kissinger came down finally the stairs, I mean, almost like a mythical figure, paused at the landing, where they had set up a little podium and he looked out over the audience and then in his inimitable, inimitable way, he said, well, I knew I would draw a large crowd when I left. <laughs> I sort of, so maybe that's what's happened. <laughs> um, look, let me, um, you know, I was going to kind of outline for you. I'm, I'm not an expert on Ukraine. Um, uh, but I do deal with U.S. foreign policy and been studying it for the last 40, 50 years. Um, and and I'm, I've tried to understand the arguments that are constantly repeated in the debates about American foreign policy. We, we have what I call forever debates about American foreign policy. Uh, and they are actually more likely to stick with us than the forever wars that we worry about, especially today. Um, and so the... Um, what I want to do is just give you an idea, give you a sense of sort of four ways that people have traditionally thought about American foreign policy and therefore has informed the way we think about Ukraine. Um, and then show you how they actually apply to Ukraine. And maybe in the process, stir up your thinking about, well, where do I fall in that spectrum of uh, perspective? Sometimes I call these perspectives, sometimes I call a school of thoughts. 
You can call them grand strategies, you know, for America. Uh, and by the way, I'm not the only one who does this. There's a lot of other the literature out there that uh, revolves around the same sort of, uh, you know, repetitive kind of pattern of debate about American foreign policy. I'm thinking of William, of um, uh, Walter Russell Mead, for example, and his book uh, on oh, Providence. It has Providence in the title. I can't remember the rest of it. So it, it's not new, but we tend to forget it. We tend to get so wrapped up in our particular view of these issues, and we have these fierce debates, and we kind of overlook the context in which that debate is taking place. All of these viewpoints, I think, are valid. I think they're all inherently logical. Uh, they make sense. Um, we may disagree whether they apply at this point in time or not, but they have a certain power of persuasion in them. And um, that's why they persist, by the way. That's why they last. So let me quickly show you how we're going to try to do this uh, and then open it up to your... Oops. Oops. Too fast. Okay. Uh, these strategies I'm going to contrast in terms of two major dimensions. All right. The first dimension is a horizontal one of what is... And, and, it, and it shows the two major instruments by which you conduct foreign policy. All right, force and all that goes with that. And then diplomacy, discussing and also then maneuvering with power. These are sort of instruments, the principal instruments of foreign policy. So one of the axes reflects the differences there and their preference for the use of that instrument. And the other axis, the vertical axis, suggests what our objective is in grand strategy or in foreign policy. What are we trying to achieve? Are we simply trying to achieve security? That is protection, defense of ourselves in a world that we cannot change, that is not going to change, and we shouldn't worry ourselves about that. Uh, we should just pay attention to how we survive in that kind of world. Or do we think that we can actually change that world, make it a little better? move it in the direction of either democratic uh, countries, which we've, by the way, done very dramatically in the last 75 years, um, or in the direction of global institutions that would, we hope, be democratic, obviously. We would hope that those international institutions would reflect our own democratic procedures and values. All right, so these four approaches, which we'll call nationalism, realism, conservative international, and liberal international, are going to differ in terms of those two dimensions. As we're going to see, nationalism is going to principally emphasize security and force. Realism, security, and diplomacy. Although realism's not going to neglect force, they're just, you know, realism simply is going to argue that you can manage force, and you can do it peacefully. Um, and diplomacy is the instrument that you use. Great statesmen, like Henry Kissinger. Um, conservative and liberal internationalism, you've probably heard a lot about liberal internationalism, all right? Because it's the belief that we need to structure the world in terms of institutions, eventually global institutions, like the UN and like all of the trade institutions we have, et cetera. And that somehow or other, we will tame military power in the international system the way we have tamed it in domestic politics. Well, for the most part, we don't have wars, thank goodness, or at least not very often, um, domestically. Uh, conservative internationalism is you know, something I'm relatively new I, or you know, hasn't been structured. I wrote a book about it, um, which, is, um, which like uh, in liberal internationalism, believes you can make the world a better place. It believes that the way you do that is largely through regime change, moving countries towards democracy. Why? Because democracies generally live in peace with one another. Not that they don't have quarrels and that there isn't always the chance that they will go to war with one another, but historically, we find that they don't do that very often. They don't even use force in their diplomacy. They don't threaten to use force. And so if you could move the world in the direction of more and more democracies, that sounds self-aggrandizement, right? I mean, it sounds like sort of self-interest, uh, but it might well be a more peaceful world uh, because we have this historical evidence that suggests that that's the case. Now, uh, okay, very quickly, let's look at what the thought pattern is, all right, for each of these, and then how they apply to Ukraine. All right, the nationalist uh, perspective, as I say, focused on security and force. 
the nationalist perspective says, look, let's just defend ourselves and let's take advantage of some of the special privileges that we have in our hemisphere. Think about it for a minute. Uh, so they want to defend your borders and your sea lanes, and they want to take advantage of the geopolitical blessings that we have. What are those geopolitical blessings? Well, it's the fact that we live in a hemisphere where we're not threatened by another great power. Every other great power in the world is threatened in their own hemisphere by another great power. We're not. We're separated by two oceans. No other great power is separated from other great powers by two oceans. Um, and, you know, for a long time, at least, we were able, in fact, to develop without much engagement with the world. Now we're powerful. We can't avoid it to some extent. But nevertheless, we still have these advantages. We can still take care of ourselves by building our defense capabilities around this hemisphere, and most importantly, around the North American hemisphere. Right? Um, we, are in the, we want to act independently. We don't like the idea, if we're nationalists, of making decisions with others or, or, or conceding authority to make decisions to others, to international institutions, for example. Uh, we're interested in defending sovereignty, that is our independence, not necessarily democracy, but, you know, yeah, okay, we're a democracy, we'll defend that too. But we recognize that values are going to always differ in the international system. Countries are always going to have different values. So you don't want to base your approach on only dealing with countries that have your values. You want to accept the fact that everybody's going to always differ on these value issues. And therefore, you don't necessarily want to convert them. You don't necessarily want to change them, move them toward democracy. You certainly don't want to engage in any nation building. So a lot of the resistance to nation building that we've experienced in this country since Afghanistan is a consequence of this nationalist view that that's just pointless. Why do we do that? We spent all that money in Afghanistan. Every time I see a picture of Afghanistan, I, I get upset because we built all kinds of hospitals, clinics, you know, agricultural. I remember I had people come to my class and talk about all the wonderful things we were doing. Most of that stuff is gone now. It's destroyed or it's empty. It's white elephants. So, you know, nationalism says, whoa, 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 be very careful. Be very careful about that kind of do-goodism in the international system. You, ha you, you, you rely on force. They are in that box which emphasizes force and security, okay? Uh, but you do it just to tell people, look, I'm strong. Don't mess with me. You know, President Reagan, whom I served, used to always say, we've never gotten into trouble when we were strong. We get into trouble when we're weak. So be strong. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean, now, you shouldn't use that force outside your hemisphere, outside your national security. Uh, count on the fact that others are going to balance, uh, others are going to take care of themselves. Others are going to defend themselves. After all, that's the, that's the most important thing which a nation has to do, is to defend itself. So you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to uh, balance against them or align with them, they'll take care of themselves. If they come to you and they want you to align with them, well, check your interests, see if that's in your interest or not, and do it if it is, and don't do it if it isn't. Um, the, the balance of power will result automatically from these kinds of activities on the part of all countries, not just the United States. Everybody will kind of follow their own interests and eventually there'll be a balance of power. It'll kind of emerge, just like, you know, prosperity emerges from a competitive market. Remember the old Adam Smith principle that, uh, you know, everybody does uh, acts on the basis of what they see in the system, then the, the best result will uh, occur for all of those participants. Well, it's a little bit something like that. Um, intervene only after you're attacked. Don't try to defend forward, especially when you're blessed with the kind of geographic situation that we have. So don't... don't um, um, go out looking for monsters to destroy. By the way, John Quincy Adams gave a famous speech in 1821. Uh, you're familiar with that speech. Many of them, many people are. It's a wonderful speech, by the way, in which he says that America is not, you know, designed to sort of go out trying to find monsters to destroy. Stay home. Don't worry about things overseas until you get attacked. If you get attacked, by golly, let them know you're there. Go out and get them, defeat them, victory, come home, however. After that, don't stick around. Don't do any nation building. Just go and show them that you better not do it again. Now, in some sense, this is exactly what America did for quite a number of years. And in fact, very recently in the case of World War I and World War II. You know, we entered both of those wars very late. As a result, by the way, we waited until we were attacked 
even after all these horrible things were happening in Europe in the 1930s and 1940. Britain almost fell in the winter of 1940. Uh, and um, we, didn't, we weren't yet in the fight. Navy would have never become in, gotten to the fight if the Japanese hadn't attacked us. Now, what was the benefit of that? Well, only one American soldier died to every 53 Soviet soldiers. Soldiers, think about that. You know, nationals will tell you today, no, wait, we've got plenty of advantages. And if we get into a fight, you know, we'll have fewer casualties. And uh, that's the best way to deal with America's security. All right. A um, lot of institutes in town who, you know, the Quincy Institute, maybe one, Cato Institute. These are groups in town that advocate this way of thinking about American grand strategy. Okay. Um, whoops. Realists. All right. Now, realists say, hey, you know, that's a little... You know, you, 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 you got to manage the balance of power. You can't expect it to emerge automatically. That's what the Henry Kissinger say. You need great statesmen to sort of deal with this anarchic system that we have where every nation looks out for its own interests. You can't just expect that to occur automatically. So they advocate that great powers have to be in the game. They have to be, uh, you know, uh, involved. And um, the idea is to create a world order, all right? Don't expect it to emerge um, automatically. What is the title of one of Henry Kissinger's most recent books? World, po um, um, uh, World Order. That's the title of the book. By the way, he wrote another book some 30 years ago called Diplomacy. Say World Order Through Great Power Diplomacy. That's the way you think about the world when you are a realist. Now, the realist is says that, wait a minute, we ought to really realize that we've got to prevent a single country from ever gaining control of two other regions, the European region and the, and the Asian region. Otherwise, we're going to be on the defensive and possibly then we're going to be attacked in this hemisphere. So maybe we need to be a little bit more forward oriented uh, than the nationalists think we need to be uh, in order to, you know, uh, deflect um, uh, attempts to try to impinge upon our interests in this hemisphere. We had examples of that in World War I. Germany you know, was in touch with Mexico and was talking with Mexico about the possibility of you know, attacking the United States. They were gonna interfere in our hemisphere. And so maybe we should be aware of that and we don't want a hegemon like Hitler to emerge in, in either one of these or, or uh, Tojo. Uh, Japanese uh, empire. We don't want those to emerge. So we need to be concerned about balancing power uh, out there in those regions. Now, when you balance power as a realist, you're not defending democracy. You're just defending peace and stability. You're not trying to convert other great powers to democracy. You're just trying to work with them to create peace. Now, that became even more important after World War II and the nuclear world. My goodness, that's a pretty important thing to do is to set about trying to preserve uh, the peace. Um, now, don't expect people to have the same values. They, they're just like the nationalists in this respect. In other words, take the world the way it is. It's made up of all kinds of different people and they have different interests. Uh, and you don't try to impose your interests on others, your philosophy, your values. You know, Nixon famously said to Mao when he visited him in 1991 or was it 1992? I mean, 1972. And he said, I'm not here to talk to you about philosophy. I'm here to talk to you about interests. That's a very sort of realist way of thinking about the world. Um, uh, maybe that's true today in China. Anyway, okay, plenty of examples in history. You know, we've mentioned the more recent ones. And then there are also institutes here in town who advocate this point. The Center for the National Interest is, 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 is maybe the principal one. Okay, liberal international. Now we move across that, you know, uh, axis that says that maybe we can make the world a better place. Maybe we don't have to settle for anarchy. Maybe we don't have to settle for endless great power conflict. Maybe we can actually change the world, move it a little bit, move it in a direction, all right? Either a direction that provides, and this is the liberal internationalist position, that, apply, that provides peaceful means of settling disputes and somehow or other controls, limits, reduces, and limits, and maybe even eliminates military power and military capabilities. All right, but you work, in other words, at the international level to create institutions that downplay all right, the use of power. That's, of course, central to both the nationalist and the realist points of view. This one says, no, that's the problem. The problem is the balance of power. 
And if you can tame that balance of power with institutions and through uh, peaceful means of settling disputes, arbitration, mediation, you know, all the kinds of things that we practice in the UN, et cetera, um, then maybe you can move more and more people towards a pluralist world in which we settle our disputes uh, peacefully. Now, they differ, uh, and I'll emphasize this again, but they differ from the conservative internationalists. They do not expect everyone to become democratic. They do expect everyone to agree on certain rules. So they believe in a rule-based, you hear that word a lot about American foreign policy, you know, or the contemporary debate. They believe in a rule-based world. All right, so rules meaning you got a certain procedure, set of procedures you have to follow if you have a dispute. You know, starting with the League of Nations, we've been developing those uh, means for settling disputes peacefully. Sometimes they work, sometimes they haven't. We were all concerned about Ukraine today, but remember 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we were all concerned about Yugoslavia. You don't hear much about Yugoslavia anymore. Well, it doesn't exist, but I mean, the six countries that grew out of that are living more or less in peace. At least we don't have war there like we do in Ukraine. Uh, by the way, the European Union is the best example of, 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 of this kind of understanding of what world politics is all about. I mean, they have ended centuries of war uh, among the countries of the European Union, especially Germany and France. All right, how? By building common institutions. Now, democratic institutions. You, you, they're, not, they're not, liberal internationalists are not uh, ignoring the role of values. They're just placing, they're just assuming it's too ambitious to try to get everybody to become democratic, just agree on certain rules and um, certain procedures, all right? Uh, develop a, 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 a set of, uh, rule of, of legal rules of law that will help you to solve these problems. All right, you work with all countries, you don't just work with great powers, uh, and you don't just work with democracies, you work with all the countries. You eventually try to minimize the role of military power and maximize the role of diplomacy and interaction. You democratize adversaries by trade. By the way, isn't that exactly what we tried to do with China? Didn't work, maybe. Most people think it didn't work. Uh, we're in trouble today, maybe. But what the heck, we thought we could do that. The European countries, by the way, succeeded in doing that. They did in integrate you know, uh, countries that were not initially democratic. Spain, Portugal, Turkey, lots of those countries. Well, some of them may not be democratic today. And what do you mean by democratic? I know that's a complicated subject, but we've got measures. We've got some pretty good measures now that we use to try to determine where countries are. By the way, they, they show too that we're not always at the top. We're not always the best, uh, but that's good. I mean, my judgment's good that we have, you know, some focus on that. All right, you don't arm diplomacy. You don't use military force while you're negotiating. That's an absolute no-no for the liberal internationalists. They're always trying to find ways to get negotiations going that avoid the use of force and that ultimately limit and reduce the use of force. Because they say that just creates distrust. You just get other countries upset uh, that you're trying to work with. So you don't want to do that. Uh, now, there's a real disadvantage to that, which the conservative internationalists will point out. And that is, what if the other side doesn't take the same attitude towards the negotiations? What if, in other words, they're just negotiating with you to keep you at the table while they're working their will outside negotiations, right? With force, with force. And you're sitting there talking to them, talking to them, and boom, they're out there doing it. Think of Hitler in the 1930s. That's exactly what he was doing. He was talking to everybody. You know, and he made agreements with, you know, so-called disarmament agreements with countries, and mutual pacts with countries, et cetera. And all the while, he was, of course, preparing for, uh, to, to achieve his objectives outside negotiations. All right, uh, again, plenty of examples, um, groups in town like the Brookings Institution, Carnegie, et cetera, who follow this. Now, conservative internationalism, it's sometimes, you know, by the way, in the debates, these things always get marginalized or disparaged. Uh, for example, you know, nationalists are called xenophobic and um, populist and terrible people. Mm -hmm. um, realists are called, you know, great power fanatics. Um, conservative internationalists are called neocons. Um, that came out of the whole debate. Um, um, but, but interestingly enough, that the logic remains. Whatever you label them, the logic remains. Now, the conservative internationalist says, look, you, you, you know, to make 
a difference and to move forward in the world. You've got to move countries incrementally, slowly, but nevertheless, gradually uh, towards uh, more open societies, towards more democratic processes and politics. And that that's a good thing. Now, not, a, not, not if you try to do it everywhere, all right? But, but this approach says that because it's more ambitious in terms of trying to move countries towards democracy and therefore join this democratic peace, uh, because that's the case, uh, you want to um, limit, you want to prioritize the countries that you're working on in order to move things towards more towards democracy. So this approach requires you to give priority, for example, to places where freedom is already very strong, like in Europe, or stronger than ever in the past in Asia, where we have strong democracies like Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, India, Australia. Um, and so the, um, uh, the point there is to um, protect democracy where it exists and at the borders push democracy forward. Now think about it for a minute. We'll come to that in just a second. Um, where are the flashpoints in contemporary world politics? They're right on the border between freedom and autocracy, are they not? Ukraine is right on that border. Taiwan is right on that border, you know, if you take into account sea lanes and the fact that a lot of the balance of power in Asia is based on seas, whereas in the case of Europe, it's all on land. Uh, but, but that's where the flashpoints are. They're now Ukraine and Taiwan. So the conservative nationalist says, you better focus on that. You better not get mis, you know, let off or distracted and go off and get involved in long wars in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever. You better make sure that you limit your objectives, all right? We're gonna face that problem today, by the way. In fact, we are in the case of Ukraine uh, because there are other places that people think we need to be involved, all right? But the conservative says, says, look, you work then with countries that primarily share your regime type. You work primarily with democracies, not with all countries, all right? You arm your diplomacy. And here's where there's a big difference between the conservative and the liberal internationalist. The conservative internationalist says, you've gotta stop your adversary your authoritarian adversary, you have to stop them from gaining their objectives outside negotiations, which means you're gonna to have to arm your diplomacy. You wanna negotiate, you want to negotiate, you value diplomacy, but you know you're gonna to have to arm that diplomacy with military might if you're going to stop them so that they get serious inside negotiations. Now, I think the classic example of this was done by the president that I admire, and sometimes I'm a little bit, you can't trust my judgment because I admire him so much, but nevertheless, that's what Ronald Reagan did in the Cold War. He always intended to negotiate. We are now piling up a lot of evidence of his earlier writings, even before he became president, in which he said, you know, there's a way to deal with this. You know, you build up your military to make it clear to the Soviet Union that they can't win outside negotiations, then they will eventually come to negotiations and they will conclude agreements that are largely in your favor and maybe also to their benefit. Pretty much exactly what happened in the case of the, of the, of the Cold War, all right? But the liberal will say, no, 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 no. Liberal internationalists will say, don't do that. Don't do that. The minute you start, you know, as Reagan did, the minute you start building up the military, all you do is excite, incite the other guy to build up his military. How the heck does that help anything? Now you got even bigger problems at the negotiating table. Well, you know, I don't know, I haven't been able to completely work out these differences in terms of which I think is stronger and more persuasive. I think they're all ultimately pretty strong. All right, um, let me move on now. Let's just quickly go through the uh, Afghanistan. So you can, let's call these now, we'll kind of translate these sort of theoretical terms like nationalism, realism, liberal and conservative internationalism. We'll translate them into something a little more colloquial. We'll call the nationalist position, you know, the stay out position. Stay out. What the heck are we doing in Ukraine? What can possibly be our interest in Ukraine? We've got all these problems in this country. We've got a border that we can't control. And now we're worried about Ukraine's border? Boy, you're gonna hear this more and more as this conflict in Ukraine goes on. It's a traditional position, it's been there for a long, long time. 
Uh, it, of course, has gained some credibility in the recent years because uh, of the difficulties that we had in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and uh, people are, that's prominent in people's minds now. They don't want to get involved in another one of these forever wars. And think about it in a minute. I'll, I'll point that out to you. I mean, even the Biden administration, which you would expect to maybe, you know, uh, um, uh, listen to that point of view, uh, they've been ratcheting up this conflict very, very substantially. I mean, talking about the fact that Putin is eventually going to have to go, that's regime change. Whew. And also talking about the fact that we've got to maintain these military supplies and equipment to Ukraine indefinitely, perhaps. Uh, um, so, you know, the nationalists are saying, whoa, before you start messing around here, before you, f you, 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 you find some reason to fight and some reason to get involved, you better make sure that you can sustain it. Uh, and they would argue, look, we don't have a dog in, that, in this fight. We don't have a dog in this fight. Now, it's more complicated than that. They make a good case. They're making a stronger case today than ever before. All right. And uh, we're going to have to, if you're not a nationalist or a stay outer, uh, you're going to have to make a pretty good argument to convince them. All right. The realist or restrainer, they now call themselves restrainers because they've become a lot more nationalist. The realists have become a lot more nationalist. I don't know. Have any of you read John Mearsheimer and some of his work in, in, on, on international politics? Probably not. But John Mearsheimer used to be an offensive realist, all right, meaning that the more power you had, the better off you were. And today he's a very, very defensive realist, just enough to sort of keep your own, protect yourself. No more than that. So he kind of reflects this move by realists to a restraining argument. We just need to restrain ourselves. Don't think we're going to make any things any better if we go out there and try to, you know, exploit hegemony. If we try to exploit hegemony, we're going to get in trouble just like every other great power in history has gotten into trouble. And so we better just stay at home kind of in a defensive posture. Notice how they're pulling very close to the nationalists who will say, hey, just enjoy the benefits of this hemisphere. Stay strong with Canada. We have a totally unprotected border with Canada. Can you believe that? Wow. Um, you know, for the most part, also with Mexico. Um, and yeah, there are all kinds of problems in uh, uh, South America and Central America. We, we know that, but, but none of them direct, threaten us directly. Now, Cuba is the only incident that I can think of where we have felt that there was a direct threat from our hemisphere. And that was because of another power in Europe intervening in our hemisphere, namely the Soviet Union, in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right, you know, there are people in town, I'm not gonna go through that, we can flash back to it if you want later, people in town who are making this case that we should restrain. We're, we're probably, we better realize that if we get involved in Ukraine, we're going to have to sustain a very substantial military effort. And we're also gonna ratchet up the tensions in Europe. So before we go that route, let's figure out, you know, if that's really the only way, all right? Because what Golgayer and Dalder are suggesting is that we maybe need to think about a long war in, the, in Ukraine. That is, it's gonna go on for quite a while. Think about it. I mean, is Russia gonna give up the territories it's already seized in Ukraine? Not very likely. Is Ukraine going to stop fighting after they've had some considerable success? And of course, it's their country and their land that's at stake. Probably not. So you're going to have a conflict going here. For, for now, the realists, the restrainers are saying, well, yeah, but I mean, can't we do anything to try to, try to stop this, uh, to try to contain it, all right, to try to deal with it the way great powers have dealt with it forever, namely split the difference either accept a divided country, that is try to get the negotiation, try to get the forces to move back to where they were before, or maybe even to stop where they are now. Uh, and okay, it's not such a good thing for Ukraine, but hey, I mean, that's okay. I mean, some people, that's just the way they, they're in a part of the world that's not very advantageous from the standpoint of their defense interests. Um, and so, um, 
you know, uh, we can't be responsible for all of that. So the realists are making a case here that we better, we can't win a long war, and yet it looks like a long war. And so what are we going to do? How are we going to get around that? Well, the liberal internationalists say, hey, we got the way around it. You simply get negotiations going. And sure, they're going to be tough for a while, but you first try to get a ceasefire. Or you try to get people just stop the fighting wherever they may be. Then you try to work on, you know, demilitarizing certain areas and places and getting agreement on where the border should be. Then you start working on economic reconstruction, on humanitarian, you know, uh, factors. Um, uh, and, and so you move towards a resolution of these disputes in the direction of integrating these countries back into the system, right? Integrating certainly Ukraine in the system uh, and also um, Russia. Russia's got to be a part of this. I mean, the liberal internationalists will say that, you know, you can't simply ignore. And by the way, the realists say that even more. So that is that you got to include Russia. I mean, come on, you can't do this by simply crushing Russia or by simply destroying or defeating Russia. Um, so you've got to get negotiations going. And those negotiations already exist, by the way. They're, they haven't been very effective, obviously because they didn't, of course, they didn't exist before 2014. They, you know, Russia has been engaged now in an aggressive uh, program since roughly 2008. And Putin, by the way, announced it in 2007. He told a meeting in Strasbourg, I mean, in Strasbourg, uh, um, Austria, um, uh, in 2007, I think it was, he laid out exactly what he was gonna do to try to re reconstruct the old Soviet empire. And of course, he proceeded to do so in uh, Georgia, 2008, and Crimea for, in 2014, and also part of Eastern Ukraine, and now the Donbass uh, and the rest of Ukraine in 2022. So, um, um, he, you know, we've got to get something going. And of course, currently we have after the, um, the 2014 aggression by Russia, we created something called the Minsk Protocols. They follow this liberal internationalist logic. The idea was to bring Ukraine, Russia, and then the OSCE, which is one of the organizations that worries about security issues in the context of the European Union. Um, um, we, we gotta get them together, all right, to talk about this, and then we'll back them up with Germany and France, core countries of a united Europe, and maybe we'll make some progress. Well, no, hasn't worked very well up till now, but it's not a bad idea. By the way, one of the things I like about this, and I'm a conservative internationalist, as you'll see in a minute, is that it puts the European countries up in front. I mean, if we're gonna be involved in this, this is my judgment now, one of the reasons why I'm a conservative internationalist, if we're gonna be involved in this, by golly, they have to take, they have to be on the front lines. I'll be standing next to them, and we'll certainly provide them with the things that they don't have, like our satellite, and, you know, satellite capabilities and intelligence capabilities, et cetera, and then some, you know, very advanced weapons that nobody else has. Okay, we'll do that. But by golly, you Europeans are going to have to step up. You're going to have to step up. Well, you know, looks like they might be doing it. I just wonder for how long. You know, there's a wonderful piece in the recent issue of Foreign Affairs uh, by um, Schultz, the Chancellor of Germany. And he says, this is, a, this is a real turning point. Titan vendor, he says, a real turning of the times. Um, and Germany has heard the call. In other words, Germany is now going to increase its defense budget from like 1.25% to 2%. Um, Germany is stepping up its um, training of, um, and, and of course, especially uh, stepping up its, man, its, its production of weapons and so on for, for Ukraine. And so who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe it'll work. I'm, I'm going to suggest in a minute that I, I worry about whether we can sustain it. All right? We've done it so far. Uh, and um, um, but Biden has actually um, done what neither Obama nor Trump was, were able, was able to do. Um, he has used both diplomacy, all right, by rallying the allies. And he's done a pretty good job of that. Uh, and supplying weapons, I mean, like crazy now, of course, since the beginning of this 2022 war. Um, Obama, did, you know, was involved in this diplomacy, but he never authorized lethal weapons to Ukraine. I wonder if the Soviets, I mean, if the Soviets, I wonder if the Russians noticed that. 
I have no doubt they did. So it might have contributed to their thinking that, hey, maybe we can get away with something here. He's not, he's not you know, interested enough. And you remember Obama did some kind of unfortunate things like saying this was a minor incursion. He says, oh, don't worry about this. It's just a minor incursion. Um, Ukraine, after all, Russia has much more of an interest in Ukraine than we do. By the way, that's true. But there he was talking like a realist, not like a liberal internationalist. And so, you know, he decided, no, he was not going to give them lethal weapons. Trump came in, gave them lethal weapons, and then typical Trump style, he disrupted the diplomacy and caused nothing but, you know, sort of headaches in terms of the, well, Biden's brought them both together. All right. But now the question is, for how long? It's going to be, I'm thinking of how hard Ronald Reagan had to work to get the Congress and the American people to stay with him on his defense buildup and then to go into negotiations and find solutions that were in the interests of both the United States and the Soviet Union. He had, to, he had a campaign going for six, seven years before he was able to show any real um, you know, success from that strategy. So how long is Biden willing to do this, especially with all of these emerging uh, domestic problems? And by the way, potentially a bad economy. You can make a case, I'm not, okay, I'm an optimist, but you can make a case that the economy is going in the wrong direction. And we're going to, we're not gonna be able to afford a significant buildup of military capability. And therefore we're not gonna be able to sustain this, uh, uh, this approach. All right, um, conservative internationalists, all right? Which is, which is where I come because for, for a number of reasons, all right? But I can't be sure that this is better necessarily in terms of persuasive power. It's gonna depend on what the American people decide. And that's the great thing about a democracy where there's a fair and, and open debate. You know, we gotta think about that when we get into all this canceling stuff. You want everybody in there, not peacefully, obviously, civilly, but you want everybody, you want the nationalists to make their argument. You want them to make it clear and loud so that you can appreciate it and decide whether or not it suits you or doesn't suit you. Um, but, um, we need the debate. So I'm not saying my point of view is better. It's better for me, or it's better in terms of my understanding. Uh, but for the country, I want the conservative internationalists to be aware of what the alternatives are that are being argued by these other uh, groups. All right, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I'm a conservative internationalist is because I think we're doing more than just balancing power in the world, and more than just trying to preserve peace. And, and I don't mean to minimize how important that is in a nuclear world. But I also think we have enough evidence, from especially the post-World War II period, that democracy makes things more peaceful, that we should have that as our ultimate long-term objective in all of our foreign policy activities. Now, that ratchets up the risk. There's no doubt about that. And um, because, by golly, you know, you're gonna, it's regime change. I mean, how happy do you make Putin when you tell him you got to go? You know, remember, that's, that's what Obama, I mean, that's what Biden said when he went to Warsaw and he gave his speech. Said, oh, my God, how does he, you know, this man has to go. Well, that's regime change. You, you better, you know, it's going to take some muscle to do that sort of thing. Uh, but that's, a, that's the objective. And I'm, I'm aware of the fact that you can overdo this. And I think to some extent, there's no question about it, the conservative internationalists called neocons, overdid it in the reaction to 9-11 and paid a price for it, you know, where we left the country after 10, 15 years, uh, when we could have left after two years and there would have been a little difference. In fact, leaving after two years, the government was in better shape than it was when we left after 10 or 15 years. Uh, so, you know, I'm aware that there's no mood at the moment for this kind of argument, but I think it's the right one because look, this approach says we made this enormous progress since 1945, creating a more peaceful world. All you have to do is know a little bit about the history of Europe to realize that, my God, these countries are actually open and friendly to one another. And for centuries, they fought one another for all kinds of reasons. Um, so uh, we need to, for that reason, we need to make sure that Europe whole and free and at peace persists. And that means Ukraine stands right in the center of that kind of objective. Now you gotta do something about Ukraine. 
All right, is Ukraine a democracy? No, no, it isn't. I mean, one of the things that amazed me is how strongly, how strong nationalism is because the country's pulled together, even though it's by no means a democracy. I mean, you know, they, they've been run by oligarchs for, 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 for the entire post-war period. And, and, and you can't, you know, I mean, you can make some cases that they were struggling and moving in a more democratic uh, direction, but, but, but not really. Uh, but if they were to be weakened, if they were to be undermined, and if this principle of national sovereignty, which of course we've been emphasizing more so than democracy, if this principle of national sovereignty is breached in the case of Ukraine, what next? All right, as I said, Putin's already laid out what he wants to do. And don't forget on the other side of Ukraine is Moldova, all right, which has Russian troops involved there. Um, on the other side of Ukraine is Belarus, where you know the Russians are already heavily involved. Um, why wouldn't he try it then further? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't, I mean, he's been pretty clear about where he, where he was going for the last 20 years. So we have to stop him. We have to stop him because of the interest of preserving freedom and peace in Europe, All right? Now you can, by the way, in some other work I'm doing at the moment, I'm making the same case for Taiwan in, in, in Asia, all right? Because it's also on kind of this fragile border of freedom between authoritarian countries and democratic countries. Now that means we're going to have to obviously invest a lot. We're gonna to have to have a, um, you know, a review of our military and defense budget. By the way, I'm not one who simply advocates more and more money because I saw how some of that money was spent in the early 1980s by the military, it was wasted. Military is a big bureaucracy. They're pretty good at wasting money. But on the other hand, they're the one institution you've got to fund and you have to have. And so are we ready? Are we ready for two, five, four, five years of significant military expenditure? It, people argue we need three to 5% of above inflation over the next five years to get our defense program in place where we can support what, by the way, we then demand that the allies do. Uh, they've got to do the same thing, uh, but we're gonna to have to show them the way, the way Reagan showed the allies the way in the early 1980s. And we're gonna to have to buck them up on this idea that you know we're not just interested in peace, we're interested in peace with freedom. And because as soon as the, you know, the Europeans are gonna be more inclined, they have been historically, they're gonna be more inclined in the liberal internationalist direction to say, let's just get some negotiations going. Then we won't need the weapons. We won't need all this military spending. In fact, it'll all be a waste. You know, that's, and, and even if you don't think there's much of a chance, how do you know if you haven't tried? See, that's a great argument on the part of the liberal internationalists, which I mean, I can't really refute. Yeah, I suppose we really haven't tried it, but um, at least not in Ukraine. There hasn't been a major effort to try to, you know, bring the parties together and force them to some kind of conclusion. Split the difference. That's going to be a heck of a hard thing to do. Think about it. All right, look, I've gone on enough. That's half hour. Ooh, more than half an hour. It's too bad. See, as you get older, you have more to say and because you know less. No, okay. What? Um, so I've already covered the last... Why don't we leave it there? Why don't we just get into a question and answer and discussion? Uh, I've left obviously some things out, but um, I think that gives you a fairly, you know, good idea. Um, and and I, you know, I, I certainly can't be sure about my own conservative. And I don't know. I've some, somebody's got to come along and make a case to the American people uh, for conservative internationalism. Is there another Reagan out there? I don't know. Um, it's a very good presentation, I think. Uh, I think we've all been aware of those different groups, but. Uh, one of the things is they never acknowledge each other. In fact, they despise each other. And, uh, you know, every time you read some article, you're, you're saying, oh, oh, no, that's, that's BS, or that's BS, or I don't even agree with that. Uh, how would, what, how, what would you divide yourself up, up into in percent between the groups? Uh, it varies. And what's happened in the last, um, in the last, um, this thing is slants. I don't want my water to fall down. But anyway, I'll hold it. Um, um, what'd you say again, now? Let me... I said, well, how would you divide yourself up into percentages? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, today, and today. By the way, I think really Biden mm -hmm. has done really well. And, and in fact, if any, he should fit any of them, he should be a conservative international. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, he has, they're, they're strong, we're, uh, good point. And I argue in a piece that I'm working on now, in fact, that where Biden may find his, where his weakness may be is in terms of following through on this policy. Because it's gonna take a very strong defense program and it's gonna take a very strong push to get the allies and to monitor what the allies are doing. I'm, I, I'm a big believer that we ought to develop some metrics for understanding exactly what the allies are doing. I mean, money metrics, how many weapons are they given? What are the value of those weapons? How much, you know, have a constant running tally because as a broad, um, you know, metric, I would say we shouldn't be doing more than 50% of everything that's being done for the military and the economic, um, you know, um, activities of the Ukrainian government. Um, so, yeah, well, I would say that probably more than half of America is either nationalist or realist at this point. Maybe, say, you know, possibly just maybe a 35 or 40 percent are in that camp. Another 25 percent are in the camp of let's just negotiate. Let's don't go this route down, you know, the route of military conflict. Just never, never any good. Very hard for that school to, you know, have a sense that maybe somebody will take advantage of you if you do that. So, and that's an easy one, by the way, in the sense that it doesn't require any backup. We just do a lot of diplomacy. We don't have to, in fact, we're, we're doing diplomacy to limit arms, not to, not to build up arms. Um, and so, and then the other, I mean, only maybe 15%, possibly 20% uh, are conservative internationalists. They were big, by the way, uh, right after 1991, right after the Venda, right after the end of the Cold War. And they were big again right after the 9-11. And they've been pretty much silenced over the last decade or more um, by all presidents, Republican and uh, Democratic. So my view is kind of lagging behind at this stage. and. Uh, you know, I can't do anything about that other than to go back to the public square and make my argument and see if people understand that if we don't do this now, if we don't stop this aggression, which I think is built into the motivation of authoritarian governments, they're, they're, they're afraid of de democratic governments, not because we're economically more powerful, it's because we represent what they could become and they will lose their autocratic positions. I mean, Putin looks at the, the West and what he doesn't want is democratic politics in Moscow. Um, and that's been historically the case for authoritarians. By the way, we, we're the same way. We're kind of frightened by authoritarian regimes on our border. And, and that's why I see you know, the struggle in, in the end, in my view, in domestic life as well as in international life, is between these two, you know, um, um, uh, is between these two these two alternatives, democratic and autocratic. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're we're heading into a period. You see, where there isn't a strong consensus to go in this direction as there was after 9/11, because boy, we had been pummeled good in the case of 9/11, and um, nobody opposed us after the end of the Cold War, we were it. So we could spread our wings and we did. Um, I still think it was, a good, it was the right thing to do. I can't imagine what Europe would be like today if we didn't have the expansion of NATO that we had in the 1990s. Where do you think we'd be today? Or where do you think we'd be today if we didn't have all democracies in Europe? What if we had as many democracies in Europe today as we had in the mid 30s? Well, how much worse our position would be, how much worse our situation would be. So I would try to make these kinds of arguments to say to the American people, yeah, I know, but it's, it, you know, it, it's risky. But all of the other approaches, I would argue, will, will kick the can down the road. The conservative and nationalist approach has the chance, the chance of actually making the world better, making Europe better stabilizing peace and democracy in Europe and potentially in the very, in the very long run, I'm not you know, naive to think that this could happen quickly, uh, you get a stable government that's transparent and open in Ukraine and potentially in, um, you know, um, in other Eastern European countries.
and maybe even a more open pluralistic system in Russia. I mean, look, there, there was a real chance for that in the 1990s. Obviously, Yeltsin was not the man to try to bring it about. I wonder if, if Gorbachev had been able to kind of slide from the Soviet position into the Russian position. What if, you know, how much better we might, things might have turned out? Because he was a man with different sensibilities, even though he was a communist and he was, you know, going to make communism work. Well, we can't forget that. He was not abandoning communism. He was just going to make it work. It was just too big a transition. Yeah, it was too big a transition. Yeah, okay, well. Yeah. Social and everything had collapsed yeah. in a flash. Yeah. And then, you know, like inflation made yeah. everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey. Hey. I know. I mean, I'm not going to be as, uh, I'm not going to be as big a fan of fate as you are, but I mean, it's true. It would have been a colossal. But look, look what Reagan did. Look what we did from 1980 to 1990. I mean, nobody thought you could end the Cold War, let alone by building up the military and and talking about bombing Moscow and all the things that he did for, for a good reason. In other words, to let the Soviets know that, you know, you better negotiate, because let me tell you, you're not keeping up with this outside the negotiations. Along came SDI, along came the information revolution. A, a great economy. By the way, we've had a terrific economy for the last three decades. And, and I, I, again, we don't make that argument very well in the public square, but we have had a, an unprecedented, strong, growing, expanding world economy for the last 30 years. We're now, by the way, starting to move in the other direction. In almost every aspect of economic policy, we're moving back towards more nationalism, more deglobalization, more regulation, more government interference in markets, et cetera, all of which is gonna be more expensive. And don't kid yourself, you can go that way, and if the American people decide to go that way, hey, we'll go that way. It's gonna be much more expensive, and inflation is gonna be a persisting problem. We may recreate the world that we had in the 1970s uh, before uh, Reagan came along. I just saw a Johnny Carson show last night. It's so amazing. I know we probably are getting We're close right to the on end. Time there. Yeah. 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 Um, well, let me finish with this little story. Anyway, Johnny Carson, my wife and I like to watch Johnny Carson because we married in the 1960s and he came along just in the 1960s. I was in graduate school, she was working over at NIH. And we had very little time together. We had supper and then I went into the study and studied all night. And she, of course, did her uh, preparations. But 10 o'clock, we always would say, hey, wait a minute, come on over here uh, and let's, all, let's, get, let's watch Johnny Carson together. So we became big fans of Johnny Carson. They now run all those programs um, over and over again. Anyway, he was saying the other night, this is 88, no, wait, uh, 89. He was making fun of Reagan, who said, I came into office and I said I would, you know, uh, lower taxes, and I said I would lower deregulation, and I said I would create massive prosperity, and I would create more equality in the world, and I would up, 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 everything he said, Reagan did. Now, he's saying it in 1989, because then he went on to say that the only problem is Reagan's going to do all these things, but he'll only do them if, how did he put it, something like, if, if, the, if he was able to do it on the island of fantasy, okay, if he was able to produce these things on the island of fantasy, meaning this was all fantasy. Yet every one of those things, I've got to go back and get that transcript, because every one of those things Ronald Reagan did, or at least it happened either while he was in office or very soon after he left office, including, by the way, a balanced budget. Why did we have a balanced budget in the 1980s, late, you know, 1970, 1997, 98, 99, that period? Because of the peace dividend from winning the Cold War. In real terms, the defense budget went down massively. And we had a balanced budget. So we even got the balanced budget, which he was always criticized for. Anyway, with that hallelujah for Ronald Reagan, I will. Well, thank you, Dr. Now. Let's give a round of applause. All right. If you have any